Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us for our final event of the of 2023, and what a lovely way to end the year. Um, uh, I'm Robert Cole, Director of the Centre for Policy Studies. As you can tell, it is next year, it's our 50th anniversary, uh, some subtle hints in the branding. Um, and as part of that anniversary, we are we're going back to the basics, to quote a former Deputy Prime Minister. We are um, trying to look back on the, the principles and ideas that animated Foundation of the Conservative Party, the Centre for Policy Studies by Margaret Thatcher and Keith Joseph in 1974, and ask what a similar principle of conservative revolution might look like uh, now. And we are delighted to have with us, well, two men who are, live, live by and incarnate those virtues. Um, our key speaker today is, of course, the Honourable Tony Abbott, former Prime Minister of Australia, member of the Board of Trade, one of the most uh, forthright and principled uh, defenders of free trade, free speech, and free markets in the Western world. And of course, uh, David Frost, uh, a, another doughty champion of freedom, who is uh, a uh, now a research fellow at the CPS, working on a project as part of our anniversary to explore uh, what Britain needs to do to become a dynamic, prosperous, uh, liberty-based society once again. So we should have a fantastic uh, uh, afternoon ahead of you, and I hope for we have to stop um, right on one o'clock because um, Tony needs to get on a plane to Australia for Christmas. Um, so, but we will, we will hopefully have time for uh, questions um, from the audience as well. But um, uh, with that, it's a great pleasure to introduce the Honourable Tony Michael. Well, Robert, thank you. It is wonderful to be here. It's always good to be in London, which I regard as the world's greatest city, uh, and it's particularly good to be in such company uh, under the auspices of the Centre for Policy Studies, which did so much to make the Thatcher government one of the all-time great democratic governments. Well, at the start of 2020, for most people in most places, life had never been more free, more fair, more safe and more rich. It might not have been the broad, sunlit uplands of the end of history, but it was the best of times, made possible by a long Anglo-American ascendancy, protecting freer speech, freer trade and freer politics. And then, for the best part of two years, much of the world lived under a virtual health dictatorship, often with a form of house arrest, in order to protect people from a disease that those under 70 had a 99.9% .9 chance of surviving. It was an almost uniquely spirit-sapping time, at least in countries thought to be free. Then, in the first major war in Europe for 70 years, Russia unleashed a brutal and entirely unprovoked assault on Ukraine. And just now, in a reminder of how seriously Islamist movements take death to the infidel, Hamas unleashed an almost bestial attack on Israel, the worst atrocity against Jews since the Holocaust. Meanwhile, the Beijing regime has completely crushed the liberties of Hong Kong, bullied all China's neighbours, even India, intensified its belligerence against Taiwanese eyes, bound to advance the party state's objectives. Suddenly, it's a darker world that's unlikely to lighten any time soon. It's true that the Western countries, led by the United States and Britain, rushed sufficient anti-tank weapons to Ukraine to enable the initial Russian assault on Kyiv to be repulsed humiliatingly, and sufficient air defences to see off the initial bombardment of Ukrainian cities. Plus, last summer, with stunning Ilan, the Ukrainians recaptured much of their lost territory in the east. But from the beginning, America has stressed that it shouldn't and wouldn't provoke Russia. So to no one's surprise, Russia has duly threatened nuclear escalation while furiously preparing defensive lines, and the West has duly dribbled in the weapons needed for the Ukrainians not to lose, but not those needed to win. So now Russian industry is mobilised for total war, Ukraine's manpower is depleted, and there's no commensurate military or industrial build-up in the West, except for Poland. And in the grip of a new isolationism, a Republican House of Representatives may well cut off further funding 
on the grounds that the Ukrainians can't ultimately win, so must negotiate, even though any negotiated settlement that didn't immediately admit rump Ukraine into NATO would reward aggression and invite more of it. Now, if it were one thing to abandon the Afghans, who wouldn't fight for themselves, what would it be to abandon the Ukrainians, who have fought with dauntless valour an, an unequal struggle for their national freedom? If friend and foe alike regarded the scuttle from Kabul as a sign of weakness, what would they make of any scuttle from Kiev? If America and its <coughs> allies won't further help the Ukrainians, who are fighting for everyone's freedom, not just their own, the question must arise, how much stomach is there for any sustained resistance to a nuclear-armed dictator with a messianic sense of mission in Europe, or indeed in Asia, convinced that the decadent West is in terminal decline? Likewise, in the Middle East, the US is now telling Israel that it can't continue its assault on Gaza more than a few weeks longer because Hamas is using its own people as human shields and blaming Israel for their deaths. So the more morally depraved this death cult's actions, the more likely it is to survive, more grievance filled than ever, in order to re-prosecute its campaign to eliminate every Jew from the river to the sea and ultimately to work with other apocalyptic Islamist movements to create a universal caliphate where the fate of all unbelievers would be almost unimaginably grim. Naturally, that hasn't stopped gays for Palestine and such like marching in their tens of thousands week after week in dozens of Western <coughs> cities, but especially here in London, calling for what would amount to a new Holocaust. Shamefully, this moral derangement was on peak display in my own country, with exultant mobs chanting slogans too disgusting to repeat within 24 hours of the Hamas atrocity, which, you'll remember, had Hamas fighters calling their parents to boast about how many defenceless Jewish families they'd slaughtered. And now the UN, by heavy majority, including Canada, Australia and New Zealand, has demanded a ceasefire that pictures Israel as the real aggressor. We're about to note the anniversary of the birth of a Jew two millennia back in what's now regarded as Palestine, yet somehow it's the Jews who are the supposed interlopers, colonialist oppressors, it's said, of the Palestinians who prior to 1948 were never really thought of as a people separate from the other Arabs who refused to take them in. Now, coincidentally, in the past fortnight at the COP28 climate jamboree in Dubai, all the main Western countries, including the US, Britain and Australia, have pledged to transition away from fossil fuels, despite the astronomical cost, despite the move to renewable power, making us even more dependent on China, which makes nearly all the solar panels and the wind turbines, upon which our increasingly expensive and erratic power supply would therefore depend, and despite no such commitment from our strategic competitors, so global emissions will keep rising anyway. To all the main Western delegates at COP, the big planetary threat was not Russian imperialism, communist China's ambitions for global hegemony by 2050, or Islamism's drive to impose a repressive universal caliphate, but a speculative rise in temperature decades hence, even though the planet has previously been much hotter and much colder without any contribution from human carbon dioxide. So to say that the democratic West has not been in such peril since the 1930s is almost an understatement. What's become apparent is that the Western world might never have been more materially rich, but we've also rarely been more spiritually bereft. It's not just that we've collectively lost faith in a transcendent being, but we've largely lost faith in our countries too. How is it that Britain is regarded by many Britons as uniquely responsible for slavery, even though it was the Royal Navy at vast cost in lives and treasure that stamped out the transatlantic slave trade, 
and it was Lord Justice Mansfield who reputedly said in the 1770s that the air of England is too pure for any slave to breathe. How is it that large <laughs> sections of a chronically declinist and defeatist British establishment are still remoaning about Brexit as if the country that gave the world the mother of parliaments, the Industrial Revolution, the, the, the Industrial Revolution, the emancipation of minorities and everyone's common language is somehow uniquely incapable of standing on its own two feet. How is it that the United States is now regarded by many Americans as somehow founded in slavery when its first settlers aimed to create a shining city on a hill and when it waged what was until then history's most destructive war to end it so that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. And how is it that in my own country the flag of some of us is routinely flown co-equally with the flag of all of us and that official speeches invariably acknowledge that it's the country of some of us rather than all of us from misplaced guilt over a settlement 200 years ago that can't be undone. The truth is that our societies have never been less racist and more colourblind as shown by the eagerness of tens of millions of people, whether that's Africans and Middle Easterners seeking a better life or Chinese who don't trust their own government to flee to us, not from us. Yet, we're plagued by past mistakes and oblivious to present strengths. So many policy issues flow from this collective national self-doubt, a reluctance to control immigration because what gives us the right to do so? Education systems shorn of the great books of the Western canon because their authors were the wrong race or gender. A something for nothing mindset in the delivery of services and benefits and an unwillingness to ask any sacrifice at all of our own people. Yet there is inspiration to be had from the near universal commitment to the protection of the Jewish state, the survival of the Jewish people and the preservation of the Jewish faith and culture from Israelis who wouldn't agree on anything else and from the Ukrainians so ferocious in defending a national freedom they've known for but 30 of the past 300 years. Their faith in themselves is a reminder of what we once had, have now lost, but might find again, as is Australians. Recent resounding rejection of a race-based body in our constitution, despite the moral bullying of much of the political class, most of the media, and the whole of the business, cultural, and even sporting establishments. Churchill's greatest speech is not amongst his wartime morale boosters, but the one he gave after Munich in anticipation of the great existential of the West. Munich, he said, was but the first foretaste of a bitter cup that will be proffered to us year by year unless by a supreme recovery of our moral health and martial vigour, note that moral health and martial vigour, we take our stand for freedom as in the olden time. As then, I fear that we are sleepwalking through Lotus Land and pray that it's not a great catastrophe that wakes us up. What's needed now as then is a clearer sense of right and wrong, stronger instincts about what's good for our countries and more will individually and collectively to be our best selves. Thank you. Christmas to you all. David, if you don't like leave the conversation, yeah. I'll come in. Sure. So I think the idea is that I now we now have a conversation for half an hour or so, and then we'll take some questions and wrap up by one o'clock. Um, I think. I mean, you you captured really well, Tony, what I think many of us think looking at the scene at the moment, um, but. I wonder, I mean, many of us feel disturbed when we look at the demonstrations, the anti-Semitism, the disdain for the nation-state that you've, you've talked about. Um, 
But do you think this is qualitatively different uh, this time round? Or could you argue that this is just another phase of what we saw in the 30s or maybe in the 60s and 70s with the anti-Vietnam demonstrations, the Red Army faction, all this sort of stuff? Do, do we not just go through these phases and get out of them, or is it different? Well, I, I didn't live through the 1930s, obviously. Uh, I did get the tail end of the 1960s, and I think the big difference between then and now is that in the 1960s there was a conservative establishment. There is now no conservative establishment. The establishment, thanks to the long march of the left through the institutions, is in many ways to the left, in inverted commas, of society. Uh, I think that's the big difference. Uh, then the people in authority largely believed in the country and its institutions. Today, it's far from certain that that is the case. Yeah, I'm, uh, that's, that's, I'm sure, correct. And I must say, when I, as I'm doing with CPS now, look back at the, the 70s, one of the things, the differences that really strikes you is this um, contrast between then when big business was kind of conservative with a small c, if not necessarily party, political, uh, conservative. The civil service was basically a conservative organisation. Um, and it's quite hard to think yourself back into that world where conservatives had kind of natural allies. And it just doesn't feel like that anymore. And you, you, you ended up with a, in your peroration, uh, saying, you know, we need a society where people don't think like this. But how do we, how do we get there then? Well, that's the $64 question, obviously. Uh, I, I think that um, a large part of the problem is in our education system. Now, uh, 50 years ago, uh, probably 80% of school leavers, uh, and often they left school at 15 as opposed to 18, 80% uh, of school leavers uh, would get a trade or get a job. In other words, they would go on to be adults pretty early on in life. Uh, and of the 10 to 20 percent that went off to university, most of them were genuinely academic. Uh, today, uh, almost everyone goes to school until they're 18. Um, at least 50 percent go on to university. Uh, many of them are doing university courses which uh, arguably will put off adulthood for three or four years without necessarily enhancing their employability uh, and without necessarily uh, helping them to meet the raised expectations of life that university inevitably gives. So I think there are cultural shifts which are working against us and which need to be addressed. I also think that uh, uh, at least um, in the last couple of years of schooling uh, and at university, uh, because there weren't as many high school teachers, senior high school teachers, because there weren't as many university lecturers and professors, they tended to be of a higher calibre uh, than today. There certainly hadn't been uh, the, the leftist penetration of the educational system that there has been uh, today. And then, of course, we've got migration. Now, uh, I love the fact that these days um, you get lots of Australians of Indian background and Chinese ancestry who are 120% Aussie uh, and speak Australian with the rest of us. I love that. But um, because of, I think, an exaggerated multiculturalism, there's also, uh, I think, some semi-official uh, encouragement of people not to become Australians or Britons or Americans as the case may be, but to be kind of long-term residents in Hotel Australia. Instead of being part of Team Australia, they're long-term residents in Hotel Australia. And I think that's a problem as well. So I think we need to um, perhaps be somewhat more discerning uh, in, in aspects of our immigration policy. Uh, certainly, 
we need to get it under better control than it currently is in places like Britain and Australia. Uh, I think there needs to be much more stress on integration than there currently is, and I think there needs to be a lot of work on our school system and our higher education system. But again, it all starts with faith in your country. Because if you don't have faith in your country, it's very hard to insist on anything. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I totally agree on that last point. And I must say, one of the things that surprised me about the, the Brexit referendum was the revelation after the result that so many Brits have bought into the, if you like, the kind of German view of the nation state. It had sort of spread across Europe, i.e. that the nation state wasn't a particularly good thing, was kind of morally corrupt or at least risked being morally corrupted in some ways and um, it was much better to kind of dissolve it in an idea or a project rather than a country and that does seem quite strong here that you know this feeling that Britain is just the sum of the people who happen to be standing on the island at any given moment rather than a sense of an actual community that is it stands for something and wants to to build something in the world. I guess, I mean, it's easy to say we need to recover it, but, but how? I, I, I do wonder, I ask myself whether the Anglosphere seems to be, be more vulnerable to this. Continental Europe doesn't seem to have the disease, oddly, of wokeism, for want of a better word, and some of these anti-history, anti-kind of culture tendencies, as we do in, um, uh, in Australia here, Canada, the US. Do you think that's true? Look, I think, I think it, there is something in that, David. And, and again, it's the flip side of our strength. Our weakness is the flip, flip side of our strength. I mean, one of the great things about, about Western civilization, particularly the English-speaking version of it, is this intense curiosity. Uh, we don't assume we have the last word in wisdom. Um, we have a natural disposition uh, to welcome new ideas, new people, new ways. Uh, and that's a good thing. But I think uh, in more recent times, uh, we're, we're so relativistic about all of this, uh, everything's as good as everything else. Um, there's been a kind of a flight from judgment initially out of a sense of politeness, not wanting to upset people, not wanting to make people feel like they're unwelcome or, or not appreciated or their ideas are unappreciated and unwelcome. So, so I, I, think, I think that it's understandable how we've got this far, but, but it, it is a problem. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, for instance, there are all sorts of customs in other places, I mean, what is customary in Gaza <coughs> is not just another lifestyle choice compared to what is customary in Israel, for instance, or in Britain. And, and I think we just have to insist that that is the case. But, but, but on David's point, um, I mean, isn't the fact that the Anglosphere is, 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 is quite striking? All, all of our countries seem to be having, tending in the same way. Is, is partly because partly because of a common language. We are sort of downstream of Australia, uh, of America. I mean, we have this. This, this, you know, the, the, notoriously you had, you know, protesters sort of saying, hands up, don't shoot, to police in the UK who were kind of looking at them with bafflement because police haven't, don't, don't shoot people in, in the UK. And I'm, I'm, I'm assuming kind of the wholesale importation of American cultural norms seems to have happened in the UK and I'm presuming in Australia as well. Yes, and, but again, where, where does this all start? It starts with an abysmal ignorance of our history. That's where it starts, an abysmal ignorance of our history. For instance, uh, you have uh, senior officers of government in Australia um, as part of uh, you know, the cultural debates that we in the Anglosphere tend to have, not knowing that it was Governor Philip who brought the first fleet as opposed to Captain Cook. Now, if you don't know your Captain Cook's from your Governor Philip, <laughs> when Governor Phillips and you're an Australian, you are abysmally ignorant. And, and yet senior people in government and in business are that ignorant. Um, I, I'm often asked if I go to, for argument's sake, young Liberal events, um, and as you all know, Liberal in Australia doesn't quite mean what Liberal in America or in Britain means, but if I go 
to a young liberal event, the equivalent of a young conservative event uh, in Australia, and people say uh, to me, what should I do? Uh, I say, read history. And I say, start with Churchill's history of the English-speaking peoples, which is a magnificent story, brilliantly and engagingly told, and then read Andrew Roberts' History of the English-Speaking Peoples from the 20th century, which brings the story up from Queen Victoria to, uh, to the Blair era. And then at least, if you've assimilated all of that, you've got some kind of a foundation for having these debates. Because when you are challenged and confronted by things, you don't think, oh, this has never happened before. At least you can see how your cultural forebears uh, dealt with this, and invariably there's much instruction on all of that. Yeah. No, I agree. I was rather depressed by the letter in the Telegraph on Saturday. I guess others may have seen it, where the, the author casually, is in the supermarket and casually says to the um, person on the checkout that uh, I'm going to the cinema tonight and going to see Napoleon, and she says, Oh, who's that? <laughs> uh, um, uh, the, the, the begs just begs so many questions that about so many things that uh, it really is quite quite troubling. Um, one more sort of philosophical question, maybe, and then I, I want to ask you about Ukraine and a couple of other things. But you started your opening remarks by commenting that in 2020 people were freer and richer and so on than they they'd ever been in the West. And I suppose I. I I don't disagree with your general proposition, but is 2020 really the right year? I mean, if you look back, um, it seems to me that uh, the, the sort of attack on freedom could well have been said to have begun 15, 20 years earlier. And certainly in this country, incomes, if not GDP growth itself, but certainly incomes have been pretty flat since 2008. And maybe what we're experiencing now is people are now really unable to avoid some of these realities, but actually the cause of the realities came quite a bit, for, a bit earlier. Yeah, I, I, I take your point, David, and there is no doubt that uh, uh, the period from the global financial crisis through until 2020 was one of um, less sure and widespread uh, growth in, in prosperity. But nevertheless, uh, while things were pretty stagnant in the Anglosphere, uh, there was still a lot of progress in other parts of the world. Uh, I picked the beginning of 2020 uh, because I, I think when the history of this period is written, um, they will say that this was the beginning of a series of shocks, the pandemic being the first, and the horror of the pandemic was not the disease but the policies to deal with it. Uh, which I think were far worse than the disease. I mean, the d disease was serious, but it was hardly the Black Death. It wasn't even the Spanish flu, and yet we treated it like it was the Black Death. And it said something about the state of our culture uh, and our psyches that in order... We let fear of death prevent us from living, and no one should be stopped from life by fear of death because the one thing that is inevitable is death and we've just got to get on with things as best we can each day we've got, not knowing when our time might come. Yeah. So, so I, th I think the pandemic marked a sort of culture shock as well as an economic shock. And, and then there are these further things. I mean, there was the rise of China which initially we were pretty happy about because we thought that um, uh, market liberalisation would eventually mean uh, political liberalisation as well. And we thought that um, uh, people living materially better lives would, 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 I suppose, adopt more of the mores of the middle class everywhere. And, and I still think there's something in that. But, but, but that was never how the Communist Party but was never how all of the Communist Party were thinking about this. There may have been some that were genu genuinely liberal, but Xi Jinping certainly isn't in, in that frame of mind. And obviously, uh, at least to Xi Jinping, the whole point of market reforms was not to make the populace richer. It was just to improve the strength of the country 
to realise the geopolitical ambitions. And, and so, so, so we've had the pandemic, the Ukraine war, now we've got an extremely uh, ominous situation in the Middle East which could easily spiral out of control. Let's hope it doesn't, but it could. Plus we've got, as in a sense, the background music to everything, um, the, uh, the geopolitical competition between the democracies and dictatorships, in particular America and China. But do you think it is really important not to lose confidence in, as you said, you know, the, the values um, of openness, mm -hmm. of freedom, of free markets, of intellectual experimentation and all those things, just because um, China and authoritarian states seem to have taken a wrong turn in the last 20 years. I mean, if you're sitting in London, Victorian England in 1850, looking at the rise of a united Germany, you can imagine people saying the same sort of thing. So in the end, Germany will be a free, democratic, rich power. And in the end, they were right. But the twists and turns on the way turned out to be quite important, and they may may well be true for China as well. Exactly. Um, but we we still have to have confidence that our values are better in the long run. Correct. Um, so, on, with that in mind, to ask about Ukraine, what 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 do you think is is going wrong in the Western approach to to Ukraine? It seemed to me that the for for the first year of the war, perhaps the West sort of subcontracted its war aims to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, this year I sort of wonder what the war aims really are for the West and what is what it's trying to achieve and what, what do you think the aims should be here? Well, I, I, I think our overall aim should be to help the Ukrainians to throw out the aggressor. I think that's what our overall aim should be. and. It's presumptuous of me to tell uh, President Zelensky what his aim should be, but I would think that his aim should be to expel every last Russian soldier from every last inch of Ukrainian territory, including the Crimea. And I think that we in the West should be assisting them to do that, and to do it effectively, uh, we need to give them more of what they want more quickly, but to do that um, practically, we actually need to be building up our own stocks of munitions, and that's the problem. Um, that requires not just telling um, the Royal Armoured Corps, hand over 14 Challenger tanks, it means actually having more Challenger tanks mm. than are currently in stock, and it doesn't just mean saying, uh, telling you know, the Pentagon, well, you've got to give them more Patriot batteries, you've got to actually have more Patriot batteries in stock. And, and that's the problem. I think we are so geared to a kind of a consumerist, dare I say it, indulgence, that we don't really want to do the things that are needed beyond the easy things. And I think we've got to be prepared to do some hard things to help them. But um, there is, there is no doubt that if Putin succeeds in Ukraine, uh, if he destroys Ukrainian independence, uh, there will be a new Iron Curtain uh, through Eastern Europe. There will be uh, an intensified Cold War. Uh, it will be, if you like, um, more global than it is becoming. So the long-term consequences in terms of the um, the ease of life of people in countries like Britain uh, require more effort now. But again, short-term sacrifice for long-term benefit is not really part of our contemporary mindset, but it needs to be. But, but what you've just said that could obviously apply to, to China as well. <coughs> it is scandalous and disgraceful that the, the Europe and America seem to be being outproduced by in terms of military, military production by Russia, which is an economy of, you know, a, a tiny economy uh, by comparison. You know, we haven't put ourselves on a war footing. We haven't fixed our mm -hmm. grotesquely sclerotic um, uh, procurement processes. But then you, you know, you compare that to China, which is already building. I mean, I think China can, you know, China can build is building, you know, orders of magnitude more ships or 
you know, weapons, uh, steel production. I mean, they are, you know. Correct, correct. The Chinese shipbuilding effort is on a par with the American shipbuilding effort at the height of the Second World War. Now, they're not doing this because they love undercutting world shipping rates. They're doing this because they want to be able to drive the Americans out of the Western Pacific if needs be and in the process take Taiwan and overcome the centre of humiliation. So all of this has absolutely central geopolitical goals which we have trouble, we can acknowledge that intellectually, but we have trouble responding uh, holistically to all of this. And there is still this incorrigible sense amongst Western leaders that people like Putin and Xi are really just like us. But Putin doesn't have to worry about a free press. He doesn't have to worry about elections. He doesn't have to worry uh, about internal opposition because you know, he kills journalists, he kills opposition leaders, uh, he suppresses the press uh, that he doesn't like. And, and he's not thinking about how do I improve the Moscow subway system or how do I try to ensure that inflation is reduced uh, for ordinary people uh, in, in Russia. He's just thinking about how do I crush, crush those bloody Ukrainians as quickly as possible. That's all he's thinking about. And similarly, she. I mean, sure, they're conscious of the fact that part of the deal for people surrendering their freedom was they'd be given more than the iron rice bowl. So, yes, he's not entirely oblivious to these things. But, but in the end, his objective is A, to stay in power, uh, and B, to, to um, overcome the century of humiliation by making China the global hegemon by mid-century. And no one in Australia thinks, how do we make Australia the dominant power in the South Pacific? Although we are, or at least we should be, no one thinks about that. Um, they just think, you know, how do we get cheaper holidays in Fiji and uh, <laughs> things like that. Um, so we we have to be prepared. We have to be able to make, you know, the mental journey. I'm sure Churchill understood Hitler. Um, I don't know how many of our people understand Putin or Xi. Mm. It seems to me um, there's a kind of unwillingness to look facts in the face sometimes, or to have sufficient moral clarity, because it's kind of easier to look away, so we, we choose not to. And another area, last, last comment from me before we open the, the floor, another area you touched on is net zero and climate, where once again, um, you know, the West seems to be intent on a degree of self-harm because of this ideology well-founded or, or otherwise as it may be, whereas the Chinese don't seem to be paying any attention no. to this, or maybe they think it's a problem for the very distant future, but certainly not something we should be worrying about now. They're more than happy to go to these climate conferences and demand, demand that the West cut its emissions, but they're not going to do anything along these lines to the extent that it hampers their rush uh, for economic and military strength. Um, and indeed, uh, I'm sure they're very conscious of the fact that the more renewable energy we, they, we have, the more their solar panel and wind turbine uh, yeah. sales increase. So it's a very good deal. Climate change is a very good deal for the Chinese because yeah. it, 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 it strengthens them and it weakens us. Do you think net zero is, this is a slightly leading question, but do you think net zero is, is another example of the um, what we what we started the conversation on the sort of millenarianism kind of deep kind of misunderstanding about the way the world works or is that a bit apocalyptic well look david i mean you know i'm i'm not a, a kind of a philosopher of religion or anything like that but uh, i i do think that for quite a significant section of our population um Climate has become almost a, a substitute of faith, uh, with its own creed, its own anathemas, its own, you know, saints and devils and things like that. And 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 you know, 
and it's all based on articles of faith. I mean, <laughs> I'll tell you a little story. Uh, a long time ago, back in about 2006, I was paying a visit to a public school in my electorate and the school principal said, do you want to visit a class? I said, sure. So I walked into a year six class and what were they doing? Talking about climate change. Now why the hell 12 year old kids should be talking about climate change in classes beyond me, but they were. I said to the teacher, can I say a few words? <laughs> and she said, yeah. I said, uh, so kids, what causes climate change? And they said, um, pollution. I said, oh, that's right, good. Who, what creates pollution? Oh, human beings. I said, okay. Um, how many of you know about the Ice Age? They all put their hand up. And I said, oh, was, that, was the climate different then? And I think they were suspecting tricks. <laughs> and so only a few of them put their hand up then. And I said to them, so what caused the Ice Age? Was that pollution? Anyway, at that stage, the teacher rushed me out of the <laughs> <laughs> But again, it's abysmal ignorance of history, which is at the heart of all this stuff. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, Let's open to some questions, and um, please, questions, not statements, and let's keep them brief so we can get uh, everybody in. Dan. Thank you. Um, Tony, nice to see you here. Oh, you, can, you, can you not hear me without the recording? The, 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 million, the millions beyond. So, so uh, Tony, if I may go back to your, the thrust of your speech, Western weakness. Uh, Samuel Huntington wrote that Western values spread not because of the intrinsic attractiveness of liberalism or Christianity, but by military force, and we in the West often forget that, but the rest of the world never does. I was very struck by how small the Western coalition turned out to be when it came to doing anything practical about Ukraine. It was NATO, Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea. The rest of the world, including countries that you'd have thought really valued democracy, like India and Israel and Indonesia, not interested. We saw maybe even more isolation over the Israel-Gaza thing. And I wonder how you would respond to the criticism that one hears often in the global south and from anti-Westerners here, that we're guilty of a terrible double standard. People say, how would you have responded if Putin had done what Israel did and ordered Ukrainians to, Ukrainian civilians to quit half the country so he could bomb it? How would you have responded if Russia had bombed Polish airstrips preemptively the way Israel did Syrians. How would you have responded if Russia cut off your, they say, we, we know how you responded, you called it a war crime and you, you called for prosecutions. What's your answer to those who say that Western policy is actually just about propping up countries that look like us, but that we're dressing it up in moralizing language? Well, I'd say they've got their facts wrong because Putin didn't ask civilians to leave Ukrainian cities, he just bombed them. He just bombed them. I, I mean, there is no doubt that uh, the Israeli uh, assault on Hamas has done probably as much damage to Gaza uh, as Putin did to Mariupol and cities like that. But the Israelis at least tried, at least tried to minimise civilian casualties by warning the civilians to leave. Putin did no such thing. And, and this is the critical moral distinction between Israel in this case and, and Russia in that case. Look, I think, I mean, I, I really dislike this phrase, the global south, but, but I, I, I also think that, you know, if, if you are looking to be critical, you can find points of criticism, uh, but, there just is no moral equivalence. And, and I think any pretense that there is, is, is self-serving, to put it at its, at its kindest. I must say, just, just my own comment on this, is though that um, the, the problem you described, Dan, of the fact that kind of natural allies don't support us when we think they ought to, is still a problem. We may think they're wrong in taking that position, but it is still a problem for the West that we don't engage, we don't explain, we quite often take friends around the world rather for granted until we've got a problem and they want us to support them. And I think the, one of the things we're going to have to do is 
go up a level in our diplomatic um, sort of military diplomacy effort around the world with our friends to make sure people are there yeah, when I, we want them. I, I think I think David David is right. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that Western diplomacy is perfect, and I'm not even saying that Western policy is always perfect, but 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 it but it's invariably well intentioned. Uh, for instance, uh, how much non-military aid does Russia give anyone? Um, you know, how much sort of uh, uh, altruistic work does China do anywhere? Um, and I don't think you can say that for a second about, about, about our countries. As for Israel and India, well, you know, Israel's got a problem in Syria, so they couldn't really criticise Putin. And yeah, India, how, did, how did that work India, out for them? No, I mean, I, how, how did that, how did that uh, policy of sucking up to Putin work out for I, them? I accept that sucking up to dictators never works. Uh, so it's always a bad thing. And, and look, India, I mean, when I was at the Raisina Dialogue in February or whatever it was, uh, there wasn't a single Indian who didn't think what Putin was doing was an abomination. But when half of your armament is Russian supplied, and needs Russian um, spare parts, and when you've got uh, uh, an oil and gas issue, it is, you've got to be a bit pragmatic about these things. Great, let's take a question over there. Yes, uh, the, the guy right on the left. Oh, right. Yeah. No, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Me. Yes. Thank you, yeah, Lockton Rowland from White Sand Insight, and thanks for a great discussion. Tanya, I hope you take a leap out of Nigel Farage's book and uh, consider running for Tory leader and escape the Australian jungle. Um, I had a question about ESG regs and the role they play in promoting this attack on our freedom. So to what extent do you think ESG regulations, which are reams and reams of binding legislation, draft binding democratic regulators, have played in uh, curtailing the freedoms as you've been describing it? Well, I don't claim to be an expert in... ESG, and at least in Australia, I don't think ESG has been imposed on businesses by the regulator. I think it's more businesses, as it were, imposing it on themselves. I think it's shareholder activists, woke directors, etc., just wanting to do this ESG thing rather than any regulator forcing it upon them. And and look. Uh, uh, my, my instinctive view is that um, the role of business is, is clear. It's uh, to make a profit and in the process of making a profit, do the best you possibly can for your customers and the best you possibly can for your staff. And if you want to sponsor the opera or sponsor a football team or you know, give money to uh, the World Wildlife Foundation, that's fantastic but uh, don't get involved in politics. I mean, one of the interesting features of our recent voice debate was the number of large public companies that gave multi, multi-million dollar donations to the campaign and the number of huge law firms that had endorsed this constitutional change before we even had the wording. I mean, imagine a law firm telling their customers to sign a contract where you didn't actually have the contract. And yet that's what these law firms did effectively in the voice debate. So again, I think there's, I think there's a, a bit of derangement, if I may uh, say so. I mean, you know, courage, character and conviction. Uh, these are the things we need. And wherever you look, they seem to be in short supply. Lots of people, I think, want to come in. Can you put your hand up if you do want to? Um, and then we will... Yes, the lady on the left. Yes. Me? Yes. Uh, no, further forward I was looking at. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Lots of brilliant ideas and, and very important right now. I wanted to ask, uh, sorry, I'm Tanya. I was Conservative MP for a couple of years. Um, wanted to ask your opinion on cyber warfare, especially regarding China, because you talk about us needing to understand Putin and Xi. And what we know from Chinese people working with us here in the UK, they talk about, for instance, pollution decreasing in Beijing. So they, the people seem to have that. They don't have the internet. They don't have their history. Young Chinese people here 
learn about Tiananmen from us. But way back, when you talk about the 70s, Arthur Miller took his play, Death of a Salesman to China, it was a sellout. Mm -hmm. And they said, you're just like us. So what do you think is the role of cyber warfare for us now? Well, again, I'm, a, I'm no great uh, expert on this. I'm no great uh, practitioner of, personal practitioner of technology or anything like that. Um, I, I think that uh, it's very important that we do what we can to get our ideas before others who might benefit from them in the same way that Radio Free Europe and um, you know, the BBC World Service once upon a time uh, would have broadcast good things into countries that didn't have a free media of their own. So I, I think using um, online uh, capabilities, I think we, we should try to do the same thing. Now, my understanding is that there are all these <coughs> Russian and Chinese bots which are doing their best to spread dissension and dismay uh, amongst us. I mean, I gather, David, you, you know this much better than I would, but I gather when uh, Britain lost the Soccer World Cup because of some failure to get penalty shots, I don't understand soccer, but, uh, you know, the Russians attacked the, the people who'd failed to get yeah. the goals on a racial basis <laughs> and then said that, that it was racist Britons, but 98% of, of the online abuse have been coming from Russia. So, I mean, they're obviously very good at doing this, and without sinking to those moral depths, it would actually be good to try to do something uh, to counter that kind of thing, um, and perhaps to get a better frame of mind in places like Russia and China. Do you want to just shout? Okay. Uh, my name is Andrew Knight. Um, isn't the kernel of this, I want to ask you, this is not a statement, but isn't the kernel, I'll put it to you, the kernel of this in the United States, which is the center of the anger <coughs> class, so to speak, under a certain age? In other words, isn't there a huge age gap, an outward gap, which informs all these things you've been talking about, including the loss of the pride in the nation state and so on? Um, and the example I would give goes to one of the things you talked about, which is what's happening in the Middle East. I was with a group of Egyptians last week, um, and some Moroccans, but mostly Egyptians, highly intelligent, some of them I've known a very long time, um, but also very biased, but highly intelligent. And they were s not celebrating, I, I don't know <coughs> if they were drinking glasses of champagne, but they were saying this is not about what happens in Gaza now. What this is really about is look at the opinion polls in the United States. Look at the opinion polls um, of each age group in the United States, obviously extreme at the younger end, but even on into middle age mm -hmm. opinion polls, I've not seen these opinion polls myself, where you see a massive shift towards actually the Palestinian point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and that this is something secular and over a long time that is happening. And this is a big event in making it happen. Mm -hmm. So I then asked, and I shouldn't go on now, well, what do you see the, as being the eventual outcome of that? They said, probably a single state, not even a two states, mm -hmm. but a single state in which uh, Jewish people live as they used to live in Damascus and elsewhere as a, as a minority that is respected, but that will take 30 years. But the big thing they were talking about was the shift, and they were basing it on the people younger than a lot of us in the room. There's no doubt that um, the older you are, the more likely you are to favour Israel over Hamas. Uh, I'm not sure that there's kind of 50% antagonism to Israel amongst younger Americans, but it's certainly quite, quite marked, as you say, that the public opinion uh, divergence. But again, I, I think, the, I mean, the young 
will often have somewhat different views to the old. Uh, I, I think the problem is that the old, the natural leaders if you like, haven't been strong enough in terms of putting their view forward. And again, let me tell you a, a story. I was door knocking in Mosman, which is probably the most well-to-do suburb in Sydney in the course of the 2019 election campaign. And I knocked on the door of the house that was probably worth five or six million bucks. And um, a woman, not maybe four or five years younger than me, answered the door. And she said, well, you've been a pretty good local member and you've made quite a good contribution to the country, but I'm not going to vote for you. And I said, why not? And she said, well, all my kids are really concerned about climate change and you aren't arguing to do more on climate change. And I said to her, well, who runs this household? You or the kids? Hmm. I mean, that's the point, isn't it? Who runs modern society? Is it Greta Thunberg? Uh, or is it people who have been around more and thought more and done more? And, and, and again, if, if there were more self-confidence in the leadership and in the institutions and in the, dare I say, establishment, I, I don't think any divergence Tony, amongst you, the young would be such a problem. You only have to look at British housing policy to know that in some areas the elderly are firmly in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly true. I suppose the other kind of uh, aspect of the answer to this is that um, it's not only what people across the West think, it's what people in Israel think. And Israel is, is one of those countries that still, to a large extent, is immune uh, from some of the trends that we've been talking about, probably because they can't afford to be quite so blasé about things as many of the rest but, of us. But, but David, on, on, all of, um, on all of the social issues, there'd be the same kind of dissension in Israel as there is in, in Britain or Australia, except that they believe in the national project. Yeah, yeah. They are completely committed to the national project in the same way that Americans might once have been committed to the manifest destiny or Britons to the civilising mission. They are still committed to the national project, a homeland for the Jews. And we don't have a national project. That's the big difference. We're going to have to wrap up, I'm afraid. I'm sorry if I'm able to do more questions, but I, I'm going to abuse my privilege slightly and ask you one last one, which is, uh, let's imagine we're in the fantasy world that was imagined a moment uh, ago in which you become leader of the Conservative Party. <laughs> what, 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 what do you think we should be doing to uh, change the, the pretty grim politics that we now face going into 2024? Well, I'd be very reluctant to give, uh, uh, it would be presumptuous of me to give advice to the British government. Uh, you, you, are, you are literally an advisor to the British well, government. I am an advisor. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I give my advice in private, not public. <laughs> um, I became leader of the opposition in 2009 because the then leader of the opposition wanted to agree with Labor's policy on climate change and emissions. And it completely split the Liberal National Party room. Uh, a clear majority was very dubious about what the then leader wanted to do. I won the leadership by a single vote. And uh, I thought, well, yeah, sure, I, I only won by a vote, but there's no point not doing what you think is right. And in my first uh, press conference as leader, I said, look, the job of a political party is to be a clear alternative. It's not to be a weak echo of the other side. And that would be my counsel to politicians who want to make a difference anywhere. Mm. If you want to make a difference you've got to be prepared to pick some issues and fight on them. And, yeah, I think that's, that's the difference. Yeah, that's good advice, I think, going into 2024, from my point of view, anyway. Look, Tony, thank you very much for your time, uh, for your thoughts. It's been extremely uh, interesting, given me a lot to, to, to reflect on, and I'm sure the audience as well. So, um, unless, Rob, do you want to say anything then, we can wrap this up. Thank you again, and hope to see you back 
before very long. Thank you.